Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. While we traditionally focus on local governance issues here on the show, we recognize the importance of the broader political landscape on municipal affairs. That is why, here on the Municipal Affairs, we have decided to sit down with federal, provincial, and territorial leaders to delve into their perspectives on municipal governance and how their levels of governments are addressing municipal concerns. Today's guest is Racky Pancholi, the two-term MLA for Edmonton White Month and currently running to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. Now, in our one-on-one interview, we will discuss her leadership aspirations, her vision for Alberta's future, and perhaps most importantly to you, the audience, and to me, her vision for municipalities across the province, both urban and rural. This is Municipal Affairs. Ms. Pancholi, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know who you are, because as uh, many of my listeners who are in the municipal realm might be listening, might be going, who is this MLA from Edmonton who is running for the leadership of the Alberta NDP? So what made you, a two-term MLA, decide to get into the leadership race of the Alberta NDP this time? Well, thanks, Chris. And thank you once uh, once again for having me on the show. I'm really happy to be here uh, and have this conversation with you. So, you know, I always I think my story is actually very much like Al- many Albertan stories. I mean, I I'm I'm a mother. I am a partner to a fantastic husband who is a, a teacher. Um, I am a big dog lover. I have a rescue dog. I grew up in Southwest Edmonton. Um, and like many Albertans, you know, my parents moved to Alberta. They moved to Canada in the late 60s. They moved to Alberta in the early 80s. And uh, I moved here when I was four years old. And they came to Alberta because they view it like generations before, as well as the Albertans who have just moved to our province last week. They see Alberta as a place of opportunity. And uh, I decided that I wanted to run because I want to talk about uh, that opportunity for Alberta. So a little background for me, it's on me as as you asked. Um, uh, I was first elected in 2019 uh, as the MLA for Edmonton White Mud. I'm very proud to have been reelected in in 2023 to once again serve that constituency. Um, I, prior to that, I actually talked to people all the time and mentioned I wasn't actually a partisan person. I wasn't a, a political person. Um, while Rachel was premier and I was not part of that that time in government, um, I I was simply at home with my for the first year with my uh, newly born daughter and my toddler son, and then I went back to work shortly thereafter. I'm a lawyer by profession, and so I went back to the practice of law, and I was watching. That's really what I was doing. I was watching the NDP government. And I was watching Rachel Notley as premier. And uh, I threw my hat in the ring at that point because first of all, I never thought I would see a progressive government in this province. And I was thrilled when Rachel won. Uh, But really what inspired me to put my name forward to be on her team was because of the pragmatic way that she governed. She governed with integrity and compassion. And she showed that when you're governing, that is a different uh, role than it is to be ideological or to be kind of uh, what we've seen of uh, what we've seen from this government so far is really taking uh, ideological positions that are about winning a fight or winning an election technically but not about governing. And Rachel inspired me with the way that she led. And so um, I put my name forward and was very, very proud to be elected. And during my time in opposition, I took to heart because I'm not a deeply partisan person. And I say that knowing that I'm running for probably one of the most partisan roles to be leader of the Alberta NDP and future premier of the province. Um, But at my heart, I think most people um, have stories and they have uh, goals and they have dreams for themselves and their business and their families that are really about just good public policy. They want to see their families be able to be supported, have a good job, um, have great access to public education and health care. And as I you know, I spent a lot of time in the last uh, last couple of years leading up to the 23 election and since then traveling around the province, talking to people um, who were genuinely undecided. And what I felt was uh, during the last election in particular, I think as the Alberta NDP, we did a good job of telling people about what they should be concerned about with the UCP and Daniel Smith. We gave people a lot of reasons to vote against uh, Daniel Smith. But I could palpably feel from people that they needed to hear from us about what to vote for. And that was what I'm interested in doing. I want to talk, move past the sort of the fear and the anger that we hear driving uh, Alberta politics, but frankly, it's happening around the world right now, um, which I think leads people to get onto teams and to see each other as combative with each other. 
I genuinely felt people were looking for something hopeful and optimistic to feel excited about. And I think that's the energy that we need people to have to be able to come together to address some of the complex issues and challenges and opportunities that we have in the province. So for me, this was the decision to throw my hat in the ring was really a response to what I heard from Albertans, that they were really tired of the small story that we're hearing about Alberta, that we're always just about who are we fighting against, um, all the things we can't do and won't do. And I think that the story of Alberta is actually much bigger than that. And it's complex and it's diverse and it's about opportunity. And I wanna get delivered to people uh, to Albertans, something to vote for, so they can feel like they want to be engaged and they want to be part of the, the great work of continuing to build on the opportunity in this province and to build out for generations to come. So why should they vote for an NDP party led by Racky Pancholi? I think since I've been elected in 2019, I took to heart that um, in order to uh, grow our party in order to get people to better understand who the Alberta NDP is, we have to be talking to everybody. So one of the things that I made a deliberate choice to do in the time after I was first elected was I didn't want to just talk to people who are already Alberta NDP supporters. I actually consciously made a decision to go out and say, who's somebody who's got maybe a really interesting business or an interesting perspective on the sector, I'm not going to approach that conversation with, I'm here to tell you how, why you should vote for the NDP or why you should vote for me, but I'm here to learn about your business and your community and your organization. And I want you to hear a little bit about, you know, who we are and who my values are, because my view is 100% we will find common ground. We will find things that we share in common and we walk away from those conversations. Maybe I haven't convinced that person to vote Alberta NDP, but that's not my goal. My goal is to say, let's build a relationship so I can ask you questions so I can better put forward ideas and proposals. Uh, and you know that you have somebody who's willing to listen and engage with you. Um, that has been the way I've conducted myself since I've been uh, elected as an MLA. I think there is a time to bring a fresh perspective to Alberta politics. Um, I think by not having been part of the government when uh, Rachel was premier, I can I can take different positions. I can hear the, the successes that we had uh, when we were in government, but also take to heart um, the critiques or the things that we can improve upon. Uh, and I can take those positions um, because I am sort of newer to, to, the, uh, to the NDP. I also think uh, I have consciously tried to draw more people into our party. And if you look around our caucus uh, colleagues right now, we have a lot of people with different expertise and different perspectives who weren't part of the NDP prior to 2019. And that is very much sort of the, the world in which I think we, we need to continue to, to grow because there are a lot of people. It is my view that the, the values and principles that we have as a party are very much uh, the common values and principles of Albertans. Um, but we need to have a, a bigger group of people with open minds and fresh perspectives that are willing to talk about in a different way. And, you know, I think it's really, I think it's about time that we had some new perspectives. And I, I think I bring a fresh and bold and energetic approach to politics. Now, the NDP in the last election were, uh, I would say, relatively shut out of the large rural areas of this province. You did win Banff Kananaskis, you won Lethbridge, uh, one of the seats in Lethbridge. But outside of that, it was traditionally Edmonton and Calgary. How do you see yourself extending an olive branch to people in Bassano, out in Dutchess, up in Sterling, out up in Wembley, to the smaller rural communities who have traditionally not seen an NDP strong presence in their community, and you want to lead that party so everyone has a voice at the table, not just the people who have in the large urban centers. A hundred percent. I talk a lot about the fact that our our path to victory, if you talk, call it that, in terms of as a party. Uh, you know, there is a way to squeak out perhaps the numbers that are needed just focusing on Edmonton and Calgary, although that's a pretty tight path and we all know that. Uh, and But that is actually not of interest to me to just squeak out a victory. I'm not in this to just win the technical amount of votes that we need to form the bare majority of government because 
What we need to be focused on as the Alberta NDP is getting a mandate from Albertans to be able to do the work that we need to do in this province. And so for me, that of course begins by looking, we, we need to be a truly provincial party. We need to have support and representation from outside of Edmonton and Calgary in all of these communities. Now we use the term rural, and as we know, rural is actually a really broad term to capture a lot of different communities. It's, you know, it's farming communities, it's mid-sized cities, it's small cities, it's bedroom communities around, around Edmonton and Calgary. So it's a really blanket term. So I don't want to begin by saying that there's one rural voice because that's actually the point is that it's very, very diverse. So I will say, I think we laid a great foundation. We've got, we increased our support in a lot of those communities. But since I've actually, prior to even announcing that I wanted to run for the leadership of the Alberta NDP, I've been very focused on that piece of how do we grow our support outside of Edmonton and Calgary? So there's lots of ways to do that. One is listening very much and I have to think that's the most important part to uh, our members and our supporters and our candidates who run in those communities because I think there's a lot of work we need to do to better reflect their views and what we do as a central party. But the other thing is simply being present. So since I've been, uh, you know, put my name forward as leadership, I spent, uh, yes, in some bedroom communities. I've been in Cochrane, I've been in Okotoks, I've been in Airdrie, uh, I've been in St. Albert and Sherwood Park. Um, but I was also up in Grand Prairie and Medicine Hat. And just last night, I was in Diamond Valley, where I got to learn a little bit about the merger of Black Diamond and Turner Valley. And now they're, you know, Diamond Valley, but their signs haven't changed yet. Um, but I've been consciously <laughs> trying to, uh, engage with folks there to say, first of all, you are our path to victory, not just in the sense of getting the seats, but in fact, representing all of Alberta. And in the candidates that we've seen coming forward, we see a lot of, you know, perspective of the Ed Edmonton candidate and the Calgary candidate. I want to be the Alberta candidate. And that means genuinely engaging with people uh, in communities, big and small, outside of Edmonton and Calgary. I maintain that the, the issues in those communities are fundamentally the same as they are across the province. People are genuinely very deeply concerned about healthcare and access and access to healthcare. The challenges are that that the solutions are going to be a bit it's, are going to be unique in rural communities, and it's different in a bedroom community like Airdrie than it will be in a small community like Diamond Valley. So, but they're concerned about healthcare. They're concerned about public education. They're concerned about um, the energy transition and what that's gonna look like in terms of jobs. They want a strong economy going forward, but they very much, all Albertans are genuinely concerned about taking action on climate change. So we know that, you know, the impacts of climate change and, and it's gonna be a big one this year. We're gonna see it in terms of droughts. We're gonna see it in terms of wildfires as we have seen growing concerns, those affect communities uh, outside of Edmonton Calgary most directly. Coal mining, of course, was a big issue that came up when I was in Diamond Valley. I mean, that's going to affect the water sources that directly impact agriculture, all of those pieces that we care about. So it, we have to reflect those, uh, those views and show that we have shared values without it being uh, just about winning the votes. It's actually about these are provincial issues that we're all engaged in and we need to find solutions for everybody. And that's how we truly have a mandate. So this is a big part of what I'm focused on. I've got a lot of rural folks. I'm actually later on today having uh, a call with about um, 15 uh, rural caucus, uh, you know, uh, presidents from our, from our constituency associations. I've appointed Bill Tanita to be my rural strategy chair because this is a key part of not only us winning in 2027, but, re but reflecting the values of all Albertans. So there's a lot to unpack there, and I want to turn to the issues because we talked about you and why you got in, but I want to talk about some of the issues that are facing Albertans right now. And you you kind of uh, ripped the Band-Aid off, so let's play in that sandbox a little bit. Let's talk about health care. Um, now, I've been dealing with, I've been chatting with municipal leaders across this province uh, for about the last year and a half. And the thing that I hear over and over again is the access to reliable health care in rural communities is one of their top priorities. ER uh, emergency rooms are being shut down at night and people have to drive two, three hours to potentially even go to Saskatchewan to get health proper health care because they are not getting the reliable health care in their own communities that they expect. How do you see yourself addressing rural health care. I know you are just be, you're running to be the leader, but I've got to ask because people who are listening might say, I'm, if I'm going to put my vote in uh, Ms. Pancholi, I've got to make sure that she's going to be advocating for my rural uh, hospital to ensure it stays open when there is yeah. such shortage right now. Yeah. So I think the heart of our health care challenges are about the fact that we 
uh, are not retaining and respecting and valuing and attracting healthcare workers. And that's across the spectrum uh, from physicians to nurses, to nurse practitioners, to pharmacists. Like we need all hands on deck and we've lost a lot of those hands. So one of the concerns that I have is that of course, when we talk about the rural closures of healthcare and, and facilities and, and, and ERs, like this is not just like something that has happened in the last few months, it has been years of this. Uh, and so what we haven't seen um, is any concerted effort to address that with, like these are, I don't wanna sit here and say, I've got the easy solutions, right? Because these are complex issues that we're not gonna solve with just doing this or that. It's gotta be a whole um, a whole array of different solutions and, and opportunities that we take. But it begins by uh, approaching the problem as a whole, right? And so one of the things that resonated with me was, was one physician that I talked to who said to me, she said, I've never seen any government put forward a concrete plan with benchmarks and targets and explanations about here's what we're going to do in two years. Here's what we're going to do in five years. Here's what we're going to do in 10 years. And we're going to say, this is what we're going to do. And this is why we're doing it. And this is how we're going to be measured and held accountable for doing it. Because the problem is, of course, in our province, because of, and I'm ripping off another band-aid here, Chris, because of our you know revenue resources being so uh, volatile, we don't make those long-term plans, right? We just talk about, okay, we've got a budget surplus this year, so we're going to invest more in healthcare. But oop, now all of a sudden we're we're you know we're in a bad we've, oil prices have dropped, and so we're going to cut healthcare. The problems are too fundamental to be that volatile in terms of our support. What we have seen in the last year and a half, in particular, is no real measures to address any of this. It's just been you know firing the board, firing AHS, you know reorganizing all of this kind of stuff. None of that gets to the heart of its people. I was in Grand Prairie and they have a pretty new hospital up in Grand Prairie, but big sections of it are closed because they don't have healthcare workers. I was just talking to somebody in, uh, in Diamond Valley last night who was telling me that um, at, at Foothills, they were down eight nurses. And so when they're, he's a paramedic. And so he was saying, when I come to Foothills Hospital and they're down eight nurses, that means I just have to sit there because there's nobody to take on the patients. So this comes down to people. It comes down to new models of supporting and valuing healthcare workers. We know that other provinces are actively recruiting our healthcare workers. Um, you know, there's incentives that are being provided to nurses. We know that in BC, they have a new family medicine uh, funding model that is poaching our doctors. And you can go to any community, particularly rural communities, and they'll tell you the stories about their doctor, family doctors who have left. We're not taking this seriously as a province right now. So it begins with valuing and respecting those, those workers. And that does mean looking at new models of funding. It's not always about investing more dollars, but doing things differently. We have to look at how we can extend care, family care, primary care. And I think in rural communities, there's incredible opportunities by looking at nurses and nurse practitioners as ways to really extend family care. Um, I'm, I'm very persuaded by the idea that, you know, nurse practitioners, especially when we're trying, when, when we're struggling to attract healthcare professionals to rural communities, they will, you know, we're always coming up with these incentive schemes to like, oh, do we, you know, pay doctors more to come out to rural communities? And those are things we all have to use all these tools. But a lot of it is we have nurses in, in communities. If we could make sure that we have enough training spaces and availability for them to become nurse practitioners, for example, that's an, an incredible way to improve access to primary care in rural communities um, and extend care. And now I'm, I'm a big believer in team-based healthcare for primary care, right? Making sure that somebody can go and it doesn't always have to be a, a family physician that has to see them. We have to use all the healthcare professionals that we have to extend care and improve access. Um, but I think there's amazing opportunities there in rural communities to do that. Um, and I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm really, I, I, one of the things when I talk about opportunity, you know, we used to be leaders in healthcare in this country. We actually used to have a world-class system. One of the things that I talk about is that it's not just like, like we're being told to settle for a lot right now uh, from the government. And we have been for quite some time. And it's not that we have to aim pie in the sky to be like, achieve a standard of healthcare that is, you know, really, really optimistic and maybe very difficult to achieve. We used to be this in Alberta. We used to be the leaders in healthcare. So it's really going back to that long-term planning, supporting the workforce, 
we could be leaders in medical research, draw the best of the world here. Like I, I'm not, you're going to see more of this, Chris. Like I've, I've sort of, I'm going to be laying out my, my healthcare policy that I'll put up on my website and, and talk about on social media. But to me, it's about saying, let's get back to that world-class level of healthcare that goes beyond four-year election cycles and is really about putting the patient first and extending that care. Um, I, w- I want to turn to a few other things that you talked about here, and I want to talk about climate uh, adaptation, energy transition, and climate change. Now, we are recording this, if you're listening to this at a later date, we are recording this about two weeks after the pause on renewable energy uh, uh, resources or tra- uh, projects sort of got uh, lifted in the province by Minnesota. Uh, by Danielle Smith. Uh, did you, were you in favor of this pause? I'm assuming not, but a, do you see this as a good move now or what could the government have done better? Because I've spoken to more rural municipal leaders and I'll be speaking to them next week at the Rural Municipalities of uh, Alberta Association in Edmonton, talking to a few Reeves and councillors who are on the front lines who have mixed feelings about the pause and what it has meant. But where do you stand on this pause? And how do you see yourself and your government, if you are so uh, 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 successful in this run, uh, working with more renewable energies? Yeah. So I'll begin by saying the original pause uh, on renewable energy projects last year. Uh, We all know now, and we knew then, even by the shock to the system, that there was no consultation or discussion done before that happened. Um, So it definitely caught a lot of people off guard. Certainly, it happened shortly after the election, and yet there was no mention of it during the uh, election campaign by Daniel Smith. We're seeing a consistent trend on many things with that respect. Um, But, I mean, the pause being lifted, I mean, let's be clear, it's not really been lifted. I mean, there's now sort of a continuing de facto uh, moratorium on on renewable projects because uh, the the, the sort of the parameters they put around where they're going to allow solar and, and wind um, is so uh, ambiguous and so unclear uh, that it essentially is going to put a, a, a pause on all of that for future purposes, I think. What I'll say is a few things. I reject this the, the government's continued narrative that it is oil and gas or renewables. Uh, That again goes back to my position that um, the government is looking at things in an incredibly small way. It's not oil and gas or renewables. It's oil and gas and renewables. That is crystal clear. We were the number one destination for investment in renewables up until the pause. And no matter what the government says now, there's no doubt that the chill has been put on investment in renewable energy as a result of these very ideological um, and and unstable positions right like they've they've under they've shaken up the stability and certainty that government that the business community that investors need to know when they want to invest millions of dollars in our in our uh, economy so there's a there's an impact no doubt about it um i i believe we are energy leaders in this country like alberta and the world we are energy leaders we are very good at oil and gas and we need to continue to be leaders in oil and gas and by, by the way We all know that that means in order to be competitive, in order for Alberta oil and gas to continue to be the most competitive and valuable in the world, we have to decarbonize. That's actually how we continue to be competitive in oil and gas is bring out the the carbon in the barrel. That's how we're going to make sure we continue to get value for the resource that belongs to all Albertans. We are also leaders in solar and wind. And we can continue to be. To me, this is a chilling uh, effect on our economy. This is, you know, any of the kind of narrative around um, uh, the UCP government being a government that is business friendly and open for business. This is completely counter to that. I'll also say, you know, for many uh, rural landowners to be told what they can and cannot do with their own property uh, is quite a surprising take from a government that can, you know, positions itself as being the advocates of private property rights um, and even libertarian values. Uh, this is government stepping in with a very, very heavy hand to tell people what they can do with their own land and to dictate and, and to control what they, the free market essentially, because the free market says, you know what, oil renewables is a huge uh, economic opportunity here in Alberta. And the way we know that it is oil and gas and renewables is the fact that one of the largest investors in renewable energy is the oil and gas sector. They know that that's the way things are going. So uh, to me, um, it's continuing to to hamstring our ability to lead on climate action and to lead in being competitive 
as a competitive destination for investment and capital. And I laid out uh, on my website, and I'll do a plug for it here, Chris, about Racky.ca. Uh, one of the, the things links I've will be in the show notes, of- FYI, if you want to listen, if you want to go to that. <laughs> Just go scroll down to the show notes or if you're listening to this in a car, pull over your car, then you can check it out. Good safety tip, Chris. Uh, But yes, on my website, I laid out about two or three weeks ago, I laid out a very detailed climate policy. Um, And I consulted with a lot of incredible uh, experts in these areas. You know, I took a a somewhat controversial position, although I don't know how controversial it was now. Um, But I did take the position that I think we need to talk about climate action that doesn't include a consumer carbon price. And um, I took that position because I think that's ultimately where we're going to be going. And I think the federal government has, um, you know, undermined the the logic of a consumer carbon price. And frankly, Albertans have never come along on that issue to begin with as well. But more fundamentally, the current UCP government, the federal conservatives have have been able to use the consumer carbon tax as a way to avoid having to put forward a credible, thoughtful climate action and plans. And so they've sucked up all the oxygen in the air by just making Albertans and Canadians fight about a carbon tax when really what they should be doing is talking about what are we doing for climate uh, to take action on climate change. So I put out a very detailed policy. I encourage everybody to read it because I take climate action very seriously. It is not only a moral imperative, because I think we're going to see some, obviously we're already seeing impacts in wildfires and droughts, but that has an economic imperative, but it is also an economic opportunity. And renewable energy is one of the best ways to talk about that. You know, there's been $2 trillion of investment in clean tech every day over the last, you know, not just not for, I mean, around the world, we need to be part of that conversation. Um, And that is an economic imperative. We don't get to have the quality of supports and services we need in this province unless we uh, have strong economic growth. And this is a key part of that. So now as we are a municipal show, I have to ask some municipal questions on this show. So hopefully you're prepared for this because right now, as we're speaking, uh, representatives from Alberta municipalities across the province are meeting in Edmonton. As I said, uh, rural municipal leaders are going to be meeting in Edmonton next week. I will be there talking to some of them. And I've got to ask... Um, because you, in your opening uh, campaign launch, you sat down with Ryan Jesperson. You talked about how Alberta is growing and it is expected to have over a, a half a million pe- more people by the time uh, the next election rolls around. This means that municipalities are going to need more infrastructure funding. That, that means more roads, more houses. How do you see yourself as the leader of the NDP working with municipalities to address some of the infrastructure uh, shortfalls that they have been calling on not only this current UCP government, but also the former Alberta NDP government as well. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, um, Chris, we had as when we were uh, government, you know, the city charters. Right. And uh, and of course, I've heard loud and clear because I've spoken to a lot of uh, municipal councillors and mayors. I was at the Mid-Sized City Mayor's Caucus uh, in Canmore um, about a month ago. I've, lo- I've lost track of time, Chris, so I'm not exactly sure when that was. <laughs> It was earlier this but, month. It was mid-February. Okay. All right. I don't even know really what year it is anymore. So, um, but uh, I was, I've been talking to, having those conversations where we know that what their ask was for the, for the current UCP government around LGFF funding. Uh, and we know that what has actually been delivered is far short of that. Now, listen, we've lived in this province. I've lived in this province for a long time. And I can tell you that this is what we see, which, which is that um, you know, we may talk and we hear the provincial government boasting about, you know, balancing the budget and having a small surplus and all that, but that is coming on the backs of incredible infrastructure debt. That is what we saw in the Klein years is what we're seeing again. And that infrastructure debt falls on municipalities because it is their citizens that it's the lack of building of roads, of housing, of, uh, you know, of municipal structures, of hospitals, of schools, all those pieces, they are all, it falls, municipalities are the ones who bear the brunt of that. And of course, we know there's limitations that municipalities have on what they can, you know, um, go into deficit for. So what happens is they have to increase property taxes, right? And don't get me wrong, I think we have to hold all municipalities accountable for the property taxes and, and question the amounts and all of that. I think that's important. But fundamentally, when you have a province that's stepping away from their responsibilities around things like housing, around infrastructure supports around things like we know the pressing issues, not just in Edmonton and Calgary, but in a lot of the mid-sized cities about homelessness, about addictions and mental health, that is all falling down onto municipalities 
who are in the absence of any leadership, in the absence of any of coming to the table, they're picking up the pieces and doing that. And um, so there's absolutely no doubt that the most important part is that the province needs to be coming to the, not even coming to the table, they need to be leading uh, in these areas that are fundamentally their responsibility. Uh, because we we can't sit here and say that we are the, the province of full opportunity um, if we can't get roads built, if we can't get projects built. One of the things, you know, I, I am an Edmonton MLA. And I was really disappointed once again to see that there's a pause on, for example, the South Edmonton Hospital. And uh, that's desperately needed as, uh, you know, the last hospital built in, in Edmonton was in the late 80s and our population was only 600,000 then. Of course, we're well over a million now. And so we desperately need that hospital. And instead, what we're being told by the government is that's just basically too big and complex of a project to do. And in my view, I once again say, when did building a hospital become too big of a, a project, too big of, of an of a issue to tackle for provincial government? How small has their worldview become of what Alberta can do um, and what they're responsible for that we're now saying we can't even build a hospital? So to me, uh, we have to go back to the province is a key player. And instead, by the way, what we hear and it's you know, percolating right now as, as we speak, you know, instead of, of addressing this really um, profound infrastructure debt, instead, the UCP government's bringing forward, bringing political parties into municipal elections. And to me, I'm uh, thinking- Can again, I interject for a second? Because I've got yeah. to put this on the record. Do you support the introduction of political parties into the municipal realm? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Continue on. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm happy to say that. Um, I, you know, I, I, that is loud and clear. I could have my own personal views about it and saying I don't support it because personally I don't, but fundamentally you look at municipalities and they've made it very clear and Albertans have made it very clear that they don't support political parties uh, in municipal elections. And again, government's supposed to serve the people, right? And they've spoken loud and clear on that. But again, this is the priority when it comes to municipalities coming from the current provincial government is to say, we're going to focus on that rather than on that infrastructure debt. They want to talk about banning or, or prohibiting uh, municipalities from entering into agreements directly with the federal government. Well, the reason why that's happening, we've got multiple examples around the province of where the federal government has been investing in housing. And the reason that's happening the way it is directly with municipalities is because the province has been absent. They pull back and not been engaged. So, um, the, you know, the UCP is putting up barriers to actually getting done the work that our shared citizens care about, right? That's the thing. There's not municipal citizens, provincial citizens, federal citizens. Uh, you know, actually, most people usually identify themselves first by the town or city or community in which they live. I'm an Edmontonian, right? And so that's, you know, we care about all those supports and services. We need the three levels of government working cooperatively. Uh, and the province has been very absent for a long time. So, yeah, I think, you know, we are going to continue to bear those costs for, for generations to come without investing in infrastructure. One of the, the, the things that the Alberta municipalities was advocating for in the last uh, provincial election was not the introduction of an Alberta police force. Earlier this week, we saw Pre <laughs> Deputy Premier Mike Ellis and Minister of Public Safety Mike Ellis introduce Bill 11, which would bring in an Alberta Independent Advisory Committee. I don't know how that is. I've reached out to his office and I have not heard anything back yet. So hopefully he will graciously come on the show after you've uh, given your thoughts on this. Um, Alberta municipalities have said we want to keep the RCMP, uh, but this government is going ahead with uh, potential changes and introduction of more sheriffs uh, into more municipal municipalities. Where do you stand on the introduction of an Alberta police force? And how do you see yourself working to address some of the rural crime issues that municipalities are dealing with right now? Because crime just doesn't happen in large urban centers like Edmonton and Calgary. It does happen in smaller communities as well. Oh, it abs you know, absolutely does. And I, I and we know that addressing rural crime, again, it's an issue that all Albertans care about, but the challenges are unique in rural communities. So first of all, in the Alberta Provincial Police Force, to me, I mean, again, I have my personal views, but it doesn't even matter what my personal views are because Albertans have spoken loud and clear that they don't, they're not interested in Alberta police force. More importantly, the rural communities where that would be in play, they have spoken loud and clear. I mean, there has been pretty definitive response from rural municipalities uh, going back a couple of years now, and probably even before that, of saying, we do not want this. So that to me should almost be the end of the conversation. Rather, the issue of how do we address rural crime is 
again, listen to the rural municipalities. What do they say they need, right? So um, uh, to me, this is once again, a very profoundly misplaced priority. And I think back about all of the things that um, uh, has happened or the province or the government has brought forward since the last provincial election. None of them were either part of the campaign, nor were they the priorities that Albertans have listed. You know, the pause on renewables, pulling out of the CPP, uh, policies against uh, trans kids, um, you know, uh, reorganizing the healthcare system, uh, bringing in Alberta Provincial Police Force, bringing in uh, political parties into municipal elections. None of these things are the things that Albertans, when I go door to door and I talk to them, and by the way, I knocked on doors in many rural bedroom communities, farming communities. I did a lot of that leading up to the election. These are not the issues that folks were talking about. They were talking about healthcare. They were talking about education. They were talking about affordability. Those are the key things that they were talking about. And we have seen nothing delivered from this government on those issues. So the Alberta Provincial Police Force, it is just simply not what Albertans want. And if we do want to address rural crime, we have to go out to those communities and we need to be talking to them about what they need and listening to those rural councils um, and their mayors and their reeves. That's who's going to tell us and we should be listening to them. Okay, you, you've you've mentioned it a few times, so we're going to divert a little bit from municipal issues, and I'm going to talk about this because uh, it, it's the most pressing, and it just happened literally 24 hours before this recording. Uh, Minister of Education came out with the draft curriculum for the social studies for uh, grade uh, kindergartens to grade six. Uh, have you had the chance to review it? Uh, what's your thoughts? There is still another round of consultations because that's what he has said in his press conference. But what was your initial thoughts when you read, or if you you have read it what were your initial thoughts so i'll be honest chris i haven't yet had the chance to take a look through it but i certainly will be doing that so prior to uh being the leadership candidate for the Alberta ndp i was the education critic and i have to say education was actually one of the key issues as to why i ran in the first place uh, i'm a lawyer and i practiced law for 13 years before i got into politics and all and a big chunk of that time has been with alberta education and with school boards i also mentioned i'm married to a teacher and i have two elementary school age kids so I can tell you education is something I'm deeply passionate about. Um, when I took over the position of critic for education after the 23 election, uh, one of the things that I wanted to make really clear is that, you know, having worked in Alberta education, I saw the, de the curriculum development process and how that should happen. And it should be a process that is thoughtful, that is engaged with the experts, that is non-political. Um, and unfortunately, the curriculum has become incredibly politicized um, over the last few years. And to me, it is far too important of an issue to become politicized. One of the things I've said for quite a few people is that, you know, I never want to be an MLA who has to stand up in the legislature and debate why Jason Kenney's grandfather is in the curriculum. But yet we were put in that position because we saw such a, you know, a curriculum come out that was so uh, misaligned with both the developmental stages of kids, but understanding of our province and experts and all of that. So I don't, to me, it is the process of curriculum development that is the most important part. People and, and, and parents and teachers have to have confidence that that curriculum has been developed by experts in those fields, not just teachers, but also subject matter experts, Indigenous communities. You know, that is how we make sure that we have a curriculum that's going to last. My kids are in elementary. They are learning from the same, some pieces of the curriculum that are the same that I learned from. That's a problem. We do need to update our curriculum. That's why the work began under, actually began under the PC governments in 2014. Um, but we cannot continue to treat the curriculum like a political football. It is far, far too important. So what I'll be looking at, yes, I will be looking at the draft curriculum because I'm a parent and I want to make sure that I know. And, and honestly, the last draft was so bad that I need to make sure that uh, there aren't any glaring concerns. Um, but more importantly, I want to hear from subject matter experts and I want to hear from teachers and I want to understand that, that they feel confident in the process that developed this curriculum. That to me is the most important part. When I met with the Minister of Education shortly after I became named the critic, I sat down with him and I said, I don't, I said, Minister, I don't, I'm not rooting for you to fail. Because if you fail, you're failing my kids and you're failing the kids of this province. I will hold the government to account. I hold the minister account. I've done that, particularly on funding issues. Um, but we really need to make sure that we 
uh, we do want to have a strong public education system. And that goes back to my other point earlier about healthcare, which is that we used to have the public education system that was the envy of the country. We do not anymore. We do not, we have the lowest per student funding in the country right now in education. Um, and we have, again, been told that we just have to settle for what we've got. We've got overcrowded classrooms and that's not just in the major cities. There's overcrowded classrooms all around this province, kids with more complex needs than ever before. So we need to, again, look at these challenges and say, what is the opportunity here? And there's no better generator of opportunity than our education system. And that's what I wanna see from the curriculum. That's what I wanna see for funding. That's what I wanna see for building schools. I wanna see that we are generating that opportunity. Now we've we've spoken at length for over the last 40 minutes, but I've got to sort of start wrapping it up because I know you were on a campaign trail. So you got to go out and got to go sell those memberships. But I'm going to ask two last questions. One is the sort of give me question is, why should people take out a membership of the Alberta NDP and vote for Iraqi Pentroli uh, in, I think it's, I want to say June, but I, I'm 90% sure I'm getting this wrong, but I think it's June 15th, but I'm, you're, you know the date. So when, why should they vote for you, basically? Yeah. So it is June 22nd by when people will have the results. So ballots will be mailed out uh, in early June. And so, yes, I strongly want to encourage people, first of all, to buy an Alberta NDP membership to get involved in this leadership race. We have a healthy history in this province of Albertans getting involved in leadership races, regardless of the party, because Albertans view that that is an opportunity to vote for the next premier of this province. And I want Albertans to look at this race the exact same way. The next leader of the Alberta NDP, in my view, can and will be the next premier of this province. So this is an opportunity for everybody to get involved and to have their say on, on who they think that should be. I believe we need, I think I am the candidate because I do bring that fresh perspective, that bold perspective. I really want to make sure that we are giving and offering Albertans something to vote for to show that we actually are a, a province that is built on opportunity, that is about uh, hopeful and optimistic thinking. And that is the way I want to approach politics. And I want to move away from putting people into which camp they're in and they're opposed. We need to bring people together. This is about showing people that the values that they hold as Albertans are the same values that we hold as Alberta NDP, and that we want to give them something to feel excited and positive and engaged in to vote for. I think we need a candidate who doesn't maybe have some of the uh, ties to previous either positions or is able to look at things in a new way and to be a candidate truly for the entire province. And that's what I hope I can be. I believe I can be that. And I've been very, very heartened by the, the very warm response we've had to our campaign. A lot of great um, energy, a lot of people really excited about doing politics differently. And that's what I'm excited to do as well. So I really hope people will go to either the Alberta NDP website to buy a membership or go to voteracky.ca and uh, buy a membership and get involved in this race. So uh, the links to Racky's social media pages and that website will be in the show notes below. So before I let you go, and I, I, I could have asked this beforehand, but I, I want to just wrap this up a little bit in a nice, neat little bow. How does uh, a Pancholi Alberta look different than a Smith Alberta? I think it looks like a bigger place. I think it's a place that is uh, more welcoming, that it is more diverse, where we celebrate the stories of Alberta that are uh, unique and diverse. We've heard one story for a very long time about who we are, and I actually think we are so much more than that. It's going to continue to be a place where people will feel excited to be here. We will be innovative. We will be exciting. We will be forward thinking. We will be leaders in all of the things that Albertans care about in, in energy, in healthcare, in education. And I think it's simply a brighter Alberta. Racky, it's been a pleasure to sit down with you and chat. I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Good luck on the campaign trail. And hopefully before the, the leadership race, we'll be able to chat again on the show. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation. Thank you. Now, before we let you go, I should note for transparency's sake, my husband, one of the producers on this show, the Honorable Ricardo Miranda, served as an Alberta NDP MLA and cabinet minister in Rachel Notley's cabinet from 2015 to 2019. So if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. 
Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, helps us amplify the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.